Subchapter 4.4 Interested Parties In the following slides, we will explore all these concepts, starting from interested parties. As we said, we could consider interested party anyone that could be influenced by how your company manages OHS, or that, in turn, can affect how your company handles OHS. So far, we made some examples. Workers, trade unions, owners, suppliers, clients, competitors. For all these parties, we can imagine their needs, what do they ask your company regarding OHS, their expectations, what they expect to receive from your company, even without ever asking for it in an explicit way. Overall, we have to think of all the different ways there could be a mutual influence. In other words, we could ask ourselves not only what they can get from my company, but also what they could give us. Let's get into more details and ask ourselves, for each of them, what are their needs and expectations? Workers, what are their needs and expectations? This is intuitive. They are the most critical interested party. Even the most efficient company may have severe accidents if even just one worker decides to ignore the OHS procedures. And, in turn, they are very exposed to every choice the company may take regarding OHS. So what are their needs and expectations? We could think together about the most common ones. Of course, when you will make your list, you will have to be more precise. The first need we can think of is a healthy workplace. Then, of course, having the correct PPE, according to OHS courses, generally being trained adequately before doing any new task, being able to communicate about injuries, near miss, and so on. Every time these requests are explicit, we can think of needs. In some of these cases, the expectations are more implicit. For all of them, we could go way into details, of course. Trade unions. What are their needs and expectations? They can influence OHS through their demands and their cooperation. What could be their most common needs and expectations? They probably want to be heard, and they want to be consulted every time there is a choice to be taken that could have any repercussion to OHS. For example, when a new kind of production is planned, or when a new kind of chemical substance is going to be used. They also probably want an overall good level of communication every time there is an OHS matter. For example, an injury. They expect to receive the news so they can make their evaluation too. In extreme synthesis, they don't want to be cut off from important pieces of information and important decisions. Owners, shareholders. If your company is owned by an entrepreneur, this interested party consists of the owner. If it's a public company, this interested party is technically made of everyone who owns a share, so by the shareholders. Whoever owns the company, the point is that since they are the ones that make a budget allocation, they can have a very decisive role. If they decide to spend more on safety, for example, by adding new protective technologies to machines, or by spending more on PPE, they could drastically improve OHS. Their needs consist of having as much cooperation from employees as possible. By cooperation, we also mean that workers should follow working procedures and guidelines. Like we saw in many other cases, among the needs, we can also list a good communication flow. Owners want all the key figures in OHS to be able to report unsafe situations, both from workers and from external parties, such as contractors. Suppliers. The OHS conditions of my company can influence some kind of suppliers. For example, the workers of companies that provide maintenance to other companies' machinery can be exposed to the risk of those companies. Or, in turn, it could turn backward. If these workers don't work in safe conditions, they could put other workers at risk. Clients. For some kind of companies, clients can be influenced by a company's OHS conditions too. One of the most common situations is that your clients may need to have some guarantee that your company is not a threat to their business continuity. In other words, they want your company to be able to keep to provide its services, because in turn, they want to be able to do it too. If your company produces cheese and your clients produce frozen pizzas, they need you to be able to keep producing cheese. And of course, one of the ways they make sure that your company doesn't risk shutdown is by making sure that your company does everything it can to avoid incidents. And we all know that having a 45,001 standard is an excellent way to manage that risk. Also, they may need your company to work safely for ethical reasons, and maybe because they don't want reputational damage in case something happens in your company. 
Even competitors may be one interested party. In other ways, the way your company manages safety could indirectly influence theirs, and vice versa. If all your competitors start to use a different, new kind of PPE, your company needs to understand why, and maybe it has to learn from them. Also, the way your competitors work may influence your company because if they have an accident, your company may suffer from reputational damages too. So, we may say that even competitors count, and we have to think of their needs, which could be fair play and the need to exchange valuable information related to safety. Subchapter 4.5 Internal External Issues Now we can go back to the global representation of the context. We just explored the interested parties area, right? Now we can talk about the other family, internal and external issues. Internal and external issues include conditions, characteristics, or changing circumstances that can affect the company. Of course, they can be positive or negative. The following are just generic examples of internal issues. Governance, organizational structure, roles, and accountabilities, policies, objectives and the strategies that are in place to achieve them, the culture in the organization, procedures, instructions, guidelines, contracts, working conditions. Among external issues, we could think of these examples. Cultural surroundings, technological surroundings, market competition, new knowledge on products, new scientific discoveries. For each of them as well, we could think of how they influence the way your company manages OHS. There is no need to discuss them separately though, since some of the things we could say would be partially redundant with what we saw before. We can talk about the most important. Technology. Think about how technology can influence OHS. New technologies may change the risks to which workers are exposed to. For example, the introduction of robotics in some productions reduced the risk of back pain, but introduced new risks. Robotic arms may injure workers. Another example, policies can influence OHS because by introducing clear rules, they generally make the workplace safer. In more prominent companies, policies are made by the central branch and are a way to spread safety culture all over the company. And last but not least, working conditions are a crucial example of how an issue can greatly influence OHS, since they determine directly how safely the worker will operate. Subchapter 4.6 how to make a context analysis. In this lesson, we will finally see in detail how to make a context analysis. Now that we have the necessary knowledge to prepare our own context analysis, let's start writing this document. That's why we switch to the build part with the pencil and the wrench icon on the upper right of the screen. In this slide, you can see the whole process of writing the context analysis. As usual, we will navigate through it with a step-by-step -step approach. The step zero of making a context analysis is planning interviews with the interested parties who play key role in OHS. The step zero of making a context analysis is planning interviews with the interested parties who play key roles in OHS. Making interviews with the interested parties, or at least some of them, is highly suggested since it's the easier way to gain all the inputs you need to write this document. So, choose the interviewees. Think of all the people in your company that have somehow a key role in OHS and plan an interview with each of them. For example, you could interview a trade union representative, the health and safety manager, the factory doctor, the production manager. The duration of the interviews should be not too short, not too long. Ideally, not less than 30 minutes, no more than one hour. If you think it could help, prepare beforehand a set of questions to make. Make sure to cover critical topics such as who in their opinion is an interested party in OHS, what are the current plans to manage OHS, what could be done in the future to improve OHS. The result of your interview will be a text file that you could keep as some sort of proof that your company made its context analysis in a very accurate way. Now that we gained the information needed, it's time to put all this information in a context analysis document. The most common way to make a context analysis document is to prepare one matrix made like this. You will become familiar with this matrix because it's the one we will use in our milestone project. First column. 
Here you will put all your interested parties, internal issues, and external issues. To be fair, in our milestone, you will find a separate matrix for interested parties and another matrix for internal and external issues. Think of this column as just a list. Second column. Here you will put a description that details what you just wrote in the first column. Third column. Here you will put how it could influence the way the Jack and Sons company manages OHS. To be more specific, in the case of interested parties, you should also write an evaluation of their needs and expectations regarding OHS. In the case of internal external issues, just write a review of how they could influence the way my company deals with OHS. Fourth column. Here we should write our verdict. Do we consider it relevant for OHS or not? This question is quite important since, as we will see in the following slides, if we state that it is relevant, the game goes on. We will keep evaluating it in our risk analysis. Finally, our fifth column, annotations. I suggest you always leave an extra column so that you can put some extra annotations if needed. So this ends the part in which we learn together how to make the context analysis matrix. In the next subchapter, we will make two simple examples. Subchapter 4.7, How to Use the Context Analysis Matrix. Okay, now that we made our tool, let's make it work. We could see together one example for an interested party and one for an issue. Internal or external issues, it doesn't really matter. As for the example, we can stick for the cheese factory example we already talked about before. It's easy to stick with one main example and keep using it in different ways rather than making many different new examples each time. We can start from an interested party. For interested parties, we could make this example. Workers. We started with this one because it's always the most relevant interested party you could think of. Making a context analysis in which workers are not considered could be judged very negatively during the third party audit. In this slide, you can see how this matrix looks when compiled. And we will read it all step by step. In the first column, we just put workers. Second column, as we said, is description. What could be said about workers in our cheese factory? How many of them? What do they do? What hazards are they exposed to? We wrote that the Jack and Sons factory has 20 workers. Three are employed in office duties, 15 are employed in the production area, two are employed in the warehouse. We also wrote that workers employed in production are exposed to chemical risks and to backstrain risks. Third column is evaluation. How do workers influence the OHS of my cheese company? And most importantly, what are their needs? I think we should say that workers influence directly OHS. Their commitment is needed in order to make everyone follow the procedures. We can't just write procedures and expect them to work by themselves. We need workers to follow them, of course. Also, what are their needs? Workers need PPE and need tools to report unsafe conditions. Finally, relevant, not relevant. Based on what we wrote before, we should state that they are relevant for the OHS in my company. As we said before, we also made an annotations column. In this specific case, I don't think there is a need to use it. Now let's see our second example. We said that we wanted to see an example of an internal external issue. We will pick this issue Procedures, Instructions, Guidelines. So in our first column, we have just the title Procedures, Instructions, Guidelines. As for description, in our Cheese Factory example, the company is already quality certified, but not yet OHS certified. There are some procedures, but not for everything. So we can write the company is already certified for quality, ISO 9001, but has no certification for OHS. Most of the processes do not have a written procedure. In the evaluation column, we will write down how this issue could influence OHS. Having a clear set of rules is considered fundamental to guarantee safety in the workplace. Finally, in the relevant, not relevant column, we can write that they are, however, considered a key element to improve OHS. Therefore, we can say they are relevant. One final thought. When you make your own context analysis document, 
be sure to put in your matrix also some interested parties and some issues that are not relevant. It will make it more complete. You will prove to the auditor that your document covers everything. As for the annotation column, nothing to state here too. Subchapter 4.8 From the Context Analysis to the Risk Evaluation So, in the two previous chapters, we learned how to make a context analysis matrix and how to write on it. The whole concept is that you have to keep doing that for all the interested parties and all the internal and external clauses you can come out with. Some of them will have the relevant tag while others will not have it. What's the use of that? Well, that's the topic of this subchapter. For the not relevant ones, the game stops here. Your company thought about it and found out that, for now, no further evaluation is needed. So for the not relevant ones, this document works as some sort of proof that, however, you thought of them. For the relevant ones, the game goes on. There will be a lesson entirely dedicated to it, but for now, we can anticipate a bit. You will have to think about possible risks and opportunities related to them. In other words, it will be used in your risk opportunity evaluation. The scheme will come back too, because it's quite essential to have a clear idea of how this whole process of risk-based thinking works. Just to be clear, this is not the only way to make a context analysis document. Some companies don't just make a matrix, but also attach a text document in which they explain with more details how they fulfill needs and expectations or the interested parties. How complex should your context analysis be? As for everything else in our system, it depends on the complexity of your company and how complex it is for your company to manage OHS. For a company of 10 employees, it could be a three-page document. For a company of 300 employees, it could be a 30-page document. How often should you update this document? Updating it once a year is generally considered compliant with what the 45001 standard asks. Of course, generally, from one year to another, the context does not change very much, so very few corrections are needed. With this slide, we completed the fourth chapter of this course. This chapter has been pretty tough, because for the first time, the standard required some practical work by making us write the context analysis. But don't worry, by completing this chapter, you just passed the most challenging part of the risk management plateau. The following chapter will be quite different because it will make us think about the leadership and its role in OHS. See you there then on Chapter 5, Leadership and Commitment. As always, for any question, please send us an email at occam at occam-consult.com.